Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 41, Dungeon Decorating, Improving Your Game Room. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for more Off the Books After Show. For those of you listening to the podcast, wherever you may be, if you want to hear the audio from those after the show chats, all you got to do is back our Patreon at the $4 level or higher. Now today we are talking about the space we play in, our game rooms. Now, after the main topic, we will be doing our usual look back at the games we played. This week, we'll be talking about Shogun, the Shadow Veil expansion for Valeria Card Kingdoms, War Chest, and Eminent Domain. For this particular week, we actually played all these games together, so I'm talking about the very same games. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, last week, we talked about tile-laying games. To go along with that, we've got some great suggestions from our fans. But first, I wanted to share a couple of other comments. Emmett O'Brien commented on our Gaming with Kids episode from a couple weeks back. Just finished listening. Good stuff. I had thought about kids and RPGs. Both my kids have GM'd games at this point, and I noticed something. Both were worried about getting the rules wrong. When I started role-playing, we tried, and massively failed, to get the rules right. There's a big difference in those approaches. We played with the best knowledge we had and had fun. My kids were either ruined the experience by getting a rule wrong. While I support system mastery and playing a game as designed is always my goal, I think teaching kids to play with the best understanding they have is an important concept to convey. Well, thanks, Emmett. And I completely agree with you. We joke a lot about our extreme play of board <laughs> games, and we do and try to encourage playing by the rules, but oftentimes we're still having fun with an extreme play. We just try to do better the next time. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to RPGs, my personal opinion is you can't play the extreme version. There is one rule for RPGs in my mind, and that is that the GM is right. Uh, they are in charge of crafting the experience for you and uh, the players, and only they know what works and doesn't. So if they want to change something, they can and should change it. And that goes the same for doing something wrong. It may be different than the rule book, but that doesn't mean you can't do it anyways. Now, Stephen Poulain left a comment on our Immortals unboxing video on YouTube. Cool video. Thanks for making it. I bought this game in a bargain bin for 25 bucks, still in shrink wrap. I don't know why so many people hate this game. I think it's really good. Any chance you played it yet? Would love to hear your thoughts on it. Well, I've shared some of my thoughts on Immortals over the show, here on the show and over on the blog. Now, overall, my main problem with it, though, was a badly set set of expectations. I was told by multiple people to expect a lighter, faster, more Amerithrash version of Shogun Wallenstein. And that is not what Immortals is at all. Uh, my second play, though, when I did know what to expect, was much more enjoyable than the first. Overall, I do think I like it. I just don't think it's nearly as good as its pedigree. Something we'll be talking about more later. Now on to those tile laying game suggestions. At Kenneba Blue, Innis has its issues, but those tiles. I gotta admit, I do not know Innis, so I don't know what it uses for tile laying. I know it's from the same line of games as Cyclades and Kemet, but I've never played Innis. Now at Random Scrub uh, says, between two castles of, of Mad King Ludwig, Carcassonne, Cottage Garden, and King Domino, Eldest kid would say Galaxy Trucker. Got to agree with the eldest kid there. <laughs> At Encounter underscore Park, the simplest and most fun I've found is King Domino. It's such a blast. That's from 
at Ned Donovan of The Encounter Party. Now, at Gatling JR said simply, Isle of Sky. Fair enough. Smug Air Throwing Scorpion. For me, it's a tie between King Domino and Fire of Eidolon. King Domino is just the perfect light game, while Fire is a bit reliant on nostalgia. I do find the game fun, and it's a small dungeon crawler with a lot to be done. Well, thanks everyone for the game suggestions and comments, and I think uh, we've mentioned it a couple of times elsewhere, but Smug Air Throwing Scorpion has to be the best name. <laughs> it is good. I, I'm, I've been getting multiple comments. They interact regularly. We, we like having that scorpion around. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Don't forget, if you're here live, we continue after the show after the double bell in an off-the-books after show, as well as some special features that might make it on YouTube. To give you all something to chat about in the chat room tonight, I want to know what your dream game room looks like. I know we tend to get a lot of RPG gamers in our chat, and what I'm curious about is I thought about everything in our list later today, mainly from the perspective of board gaming. There is a couple things I mentioned for RPGs, and I'm wondering how that might differ, how it, what an RPG or GM's uh, dream game room would look like compared to, say, a board game. We'll be back checking in with the chat room throughout the show. We are here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, the best way for questions to come through is through the website. They won't get missed. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere, as this next question does indicate. Today, we're talking about game rooms based on a question from Mr. MCB, who wrote on Instagram to ask. So the wife and I just bought a house and one of the rooms will be dedicated to gaming. So let me ask you this. If you could change or add or do something better, what would it be? What problems do you have that you would fix? Well, thanks for the question, Mr. MCB. I wanted to say, first off, that it is awesome that this question comes from Instagram. I dig that people are asking us stuff all over the web. You can find us everywhere at Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, give me the question. I've got a game room I'm pretty proud of, but there are definitely some things I would change or improve. I'm going to focus on a couple of things. First off is lighting. The biggest problem we have playing games, and even more importantly lately, streaming games, is glare. Uh, this has gotten worse. Now that we live stream our plays, it's definitely it's affecting what other people see, not just the people at the table. My green room is in the basement. And the lights are these pot lights set into the ceiling, and they basically create spotlights, hot spots on my game table, four of them right on the table. And I got to admit, I wish we had some more diffused lights down there. Now, one of the reasons I haven't done anything about this is problem number two, a very low ceiling. Now, it's not super low, like you're banging your head, but there's just no space to do something like replace those lights. The other thing is I would love to mount a camera facing down onto the table, but everything we have tested, just it's too close to the table. We can't get wide enough. I would love to move that ceiling up. And if I could move the ceiling up, then I could replace the lights with something else. So in reality, these two problems are mostly the same problem. Uh, if there were higher ceilings, the lighting wouldn't be as real a problem or at least an easily solvable one. Mm -hmm. uh, and more space in general would really allow more flexibility, especially with broadcast requirements in mind. Uh, you really can't ever have too much space when it comes to recording setups, uh, but I'll get more into that in some of our specific discussions later. So now that I've answered Mr. MCB's question, that was a little short, right? It's going to make for a bad podcast. We just stopped there. I thought it's worthwhile to take a step back, and I just want to talk about game rooms in general. Basically, what makes for a good game room? What are the must-haves? What do you have to have to have a good game room? And what are some good additions to make a decent game room better? Plus, I do want to dream a little bit and look at a few dream items, stuff that just takes that game room to the next level. Nothing you need at all, but stuff you may want and may want badly. Now, I expect this will be a wildly varied topic because no two people will likely ever have the same idea mm -hmm. about a gaming space. Put three gamers in a room and ask them about what they want, you'll get four answers. <laughs> but first up, the must-haves. 
I think the most basic things besides, you know, the obvious you'd want games and people to play them, you need a place to play them. You need a room. We're assuming you have a room. The next big thing is a table. You need some type of surface to game on unless you're doing a LARP or playing two rooms in a boom. Pretty much this is tabletop bellhop. You need that tabletop. Uh, this could be anything from a couple TV trays pushed together to a massive custom designed table from board game tables. I got to say, most people are going to go for something in between. Now, I do have one tip I learned. When we were shopping around for a game table at my house, I wanted an 8x4 table. And we started off at furniture stores. Then we went to Amish communities looking for a nice wood table. The one thing we found that was way cheaper than both of those is a boardroom table at office supply stores. You can generally get a much larger boardroom table for cheaper than your average kitchen or dining room type style table. I'm not sure why that is. I, something to do with the marketing of it. I'm sure the materials are the same. The other thing to check out, if you don't want to spend the ridiculous cost for a custom game table, but you already have like a kitchen table, is a company called Game Toppers. And what they make is table overlays that go on top of your existing table. So you get that feel of a full, nice custom table without the huge cost. Now, this is the first time I'll start talking about size. Now, while you might love the idea of a four by eight or someone mentioned six by eight table mm -hmm. to play with 10 different people and have all that map space in the middle, if your room is eight foot by 10 foot, you may want to stop and think. Mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of things that are going to go into your game room, game room and how much room the people take up is one of those details that often gets left out. I think back to our breakout con review uh, where the board game room for this massive con didn't have enough space and players mm. at the board game tables were bumping up against players at the library trying to get board games out. There just yeah. wasn't enough room to get by. They didn't think, they thought about their board gaming space and they thought about their library space, but they forgot about the people and, you know, people just got in the way of what was yeah. going on. Uh, and that's something that you need to think about in your room. You need to think about chairs and how much space they take up. So, they forgot about the chairs. So yeah, that's my number two. You're going to need somewhere to sit. Again, unless you're LARPing or playing two rooms in a boom. Uh, basically, you want everyone to be comfortable. Uh, this one, to me, is almost as important, if not more so, than your table. I played many RPGs sitting on couches. If you're an RPG player, you're probably better off with some nice comfy chairs and no table. You can roll your dice on your books. I remember sitting at the University of Windsor playing Akrima City and Warhammer and using the hardcover rule books as our roll rolling surface. But the best part of that was the nice comfy chairs. They have these nice luxurious couches. Now everyone has their own preferences for chairs. Now I'm going to go again with what I like are the big wooden capstans chairs with the, the arms on them, big round backs. We have a shrinking number of them because these are something that were popular in the 70s and are hard to find nowadays and they're starting to wear. Uh, secondary are the padded dining room chairs. The I particularly like the ones with tons of foam in them. Again, popular in the 70s. I think part of that might be that I grew up with those around our dining room table when I was a kid and well, we still have some of those. But they're also rather comfy. The padding is really nice even though it might be poking out in a couple spots. Now, due to this, most of my game room chairs, if they're not literally hand-me-downs from when I was a kid that came from my mom's house, have come from thrift shops. So whenever we're out thrifting or we pass by an antique store or we happen to be out of town, I like to hit up Value Villages, we're always keeping my eye out for not only like the, the rare chance of finding a sealed copy of Hero Quest for three bucks, which only ever happens on the internet as far as I can tell, I'm also looking at chairs that would go good in my game room. Now... But again, chairs take up space. So remember, they won't be pushed all the way in and need to be maneuvered around. Draw it out if you need to. But in, a, in a, an ideal situation, you'd want to be able to have someone walk all the way around your table while all the people were seated mm -hmm. at it. And people will never slide a chair in as far as you might imagine they do in a perfect <laughs> world. Uh, <laughs> Very true. Uh, up next... You want your chair, or sorry, you want your table and the games on it to be well lit. So my last big requirement for just your basic game room is lighting. 
You want to be able to see. Now, this isn't just for eye strain reasons. It's going to speed up gameplay. If people aren't saying, hey, what's that say over there? What's What color is that? Or can you pass me that card? You want things well lit. Uh, this is even more important, I find, for public play areas. That's one of the reasons people often will play at home in their mom's basement, because the basement's better lit than the local game store or the local pub or the coffee shop. So if you're designing your own game room, make sure there's plenty of light. And personally, I say watch out for glare, right? So watch out for those pot lights. For some reason, anything that shines a bright light in one spot, not great for a gaming room. You want ambient light if possible. Uh, the other thing you might want to do if you're shopping for lighting is bring a board, piece of the board from something shiny, right? Something that's laminated with you so you can see just how bad it is. Because I've got to admit, like looking in the room when we bought the place, when we set up the table, it didn't look like it was going to be a problem. It wasn't until we threw our first dungeon map out there and like, ooh, Okay, I can't see that huge section in the middle there. So there are two factors that will make the biggest impact for your lighting. First is size, um, that size of your lighting, whatever is giving off the light, and second, distance. Those are the two main things to think about that'll make your huge difference. Now, what you want is a large source that's not too close, really. I mean, that's the basics of, of it. Now, my career is based on lighting things, so I could go on for hours just talking about this, and I'll, but I'll keep it simple. Diffused lighting is soft lighting, which means soft shadows and soft glare, basically. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what you want is soft shadows. If you put your hand out over the table and your shadow is crisp and well-defined, you can you know, make out every detail of your hand, that's bad. Uh, now, one easy solution, if you have the space, is to bounce lights. Shining your lights up into, the white, into a white or light gray ceiling so that the ceiling itself becomes a giant light source is a great way to cheat and get a nice soft diffused lighting. It's why photographers will bounce their flashes off of walls and ceilings instead of pointing them at their subject. It's to use that other wall or ceiling as the lighting source itself. Now, if you don't have the space, and something I'm going to be looking at with Mo offline is LED strips. Mm -hmm. So you can get something like this super cheap uh, pretty much anywhere now. Uh, and if you get enough of it, you end up building a giant diffused light source. So you can turn your ceiling into a giant light. Now, did we note that Sean works in lighting? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you have questions, it's Sean at tabletopbellhop.com. Seriously, like say, I'm sure Sean right. will happily answer your lighting tips if you have anything. While I, you while know, I... the light strips are something I've been considering, even just for the Philips Hue. I want to put a set around the bottom of the game table, yep. but that's not going to really help my live plays. That's just no. for <laughs> that's just decoration. But uh, we'll get to that later. Yep. So to me, that's it. Those those three things are your your main requirements. Like I said, not counting games and players. We're we're assuming you figured those things out. And if you haven't, we got lots of other episodes you can listen to for finding both. Um, you need a table. You need somewhere to sit. And you need it to be well lit. That that to me is the basic game room. Whether that's you know two folding chairs in front of a TV tray with a lamp hanging over top. There's your basic game room. Now, I want to talk about stepping that up a bit. So these are the rather nice to haves. None of these are absolutely necessary, but they're the kind of thing you're going to want. And the first one I've got on the list is one that I do not have and I wish I did. And that is a better surround sound or some type of sound system in my game area. Now, there are tons of tools out there for adding sound to your games. Like we did a whole podcast on it and we did a blog post about adding music and sound effects to enhance your game. We talked about Sirenscapes and I talked about, um, I don't even remember all the different types of software for adding games in. We even talked about ambient sounds and music to play board games to and board gaming playlists that you can find online for your Terraforming Mars event to just kind of improve the immersion, right? I really dig it. You want full surround here you don't want the sound to come from someone's phone on the table which is what i'm stuck with is actually an ipod touch or my phone sitting on the table to to give that and it's usually just way too obvious that i'm playing sound from my phone and doesn't really give that ambiance or atmosphere so my suggestion is really to go with either sound bars or bluetooth speakers uh well sure having a full surround experience would be ideal uh, it's also a huge hassle a lot of times and you need to start thinking about direction. You want to, yeah, you know, if you actually want to, you know, have the sound come from the right place and start thinking about direction and where everyone's sitting. Uh, but if you drop a decent full coverage Bluetooth speaker right in the middle of your table, 
um, you're actually going to get a pretty nice even sound all the way around. And if you even upgrade that and go to a Google Home or an Amazon device, you, they can perform double duty as both an information source and a Bluetooth <laughs> speaker. I had to admit you're right there. I, I'm saying surround sound, but I didn't actually mean like 7.1. I just meant surround <laughs> all around. I should have yeah. said all around sound. Like a speaker in all four corners was the main thing I was thinking. It's something wireless Bluetooth. Now, 5.7. I don't even know what they're up to now. Last time <laughs> I bought surround sound speakers, it was 5.1. But that'd be kind of cool. Like I could see doing some sound effects like go around the room or something like that. But yeah, that's that gets into the wishful thinking, <laughs> I think. Now, the other thing, obviously, you got your games, you got your people, you got your table. Where are the games going to go? Storage. You need somewhere to store those games. The big name for board game shelving is Kallax. I don't, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. Uh, we own some. I don't have any board games in mine. That's where the kids' toys go. What I actually have is office bookshelves. Going back to that whole for some reason, office furniture seems to be cheaper than normal people furniture. I was able to order the bookshelves at the same time we got the boardroom table and got a good price on it. Plus, I could color match them. So the shelves match the game table. Uh, but even then, you could just go to the dollar store and get those hardware store shelves, the hardware shelves that are made out of plastic, right? You buy like a stack of four shelves and the tubes are all in there and you can snap it all together where you kick it up just that slight notch and go to like Home Depot and buy the metal rack mesh racking. You know, the type of shelves, the cheap shelves, they work. There's no reason you have to get Calax. Now, Calax is your high end. So far, I have yet to see anyone recommend something better than Calax selves. They seem to be the industry standard. And from what I've heard, do not buy the Target, Walmart, the cubes shelves that just look the same. They just don't have that one inch thickness that you're going to need for some heavy games, especially if you're into box inserts. If you start throwing wooden box inserts onto quarter inch shelves, you're going to have problems. Trust me, I know if you look at the white doors behind me, there's probably a bit of a bow in that, and i got to flip that shelf again. Now, one thing to think about is where you store your games in the house. So that's where your shelves will be. Uh, if no one is going to see it, you can save money. Mm -hmm. But also to think about, if your game room is in the basement and there's even a slight chance of flooding yeah. where you live, you really want to consider that plastic solution, even if it might not look as fantastic. You'll be glad you did when you don't have to replace a pricey bookcase or worse, the games that were damaged when the wooden bookshelf soaked up water mm -hmm. and got the boxes wet anyway. So. Yeah, think... plus uh, keep the games off the floor, right? Yeah. If you're in the basement, <laughs> you want to keep the games off the floor as well. Yeah, I, now, hope, I another, hope that's, <laughs> I hope that's a given. Another aspect but... of this too is how to organize your game collection. We have a previous episode for that. There'll be a link in the show notes. I'm sure Sean will probably grab the number in the next couple minutes. I don't remember. It was a little while ago where we talk all about how to organize the games on that shelves. And just to uh, jump to the chat for one quick session, Deanna, going back to what I mentioned about the white doors, flip your shelves if you have standard bookshelves. But once a year, you should be flipping those shelves over to make sure they don't get bowed. And you know you bought cheap bookcases if the other side is unfinished. You're like, oh, no, I cheaped out here. Uh, up next, we talked about this a little bit earlier, is kicking those lights up to the next level, which is programmable lights. Uh, back when I bought them, the Philips Hue lights were the lights to buy. Nowadays, as far as I can tell, there's a million different varieties. Some are way cheaper than Philips, and as far as I can tell, just as good. So I, I'm going to pimp Philips because I'm impressed by what I have, but there are cheaper solutions out there that, as far as I can tell, are just as good. Now, I don't use these every game. They, they can be distracting. Listen to our Tech on the Table episode. We talk all about that. Um, but I think there is nothing better than being able to set the mood, especially in a role-playing game, by changing the lighting in the room. It's not something you do every scene, every five seconds, but you get to that boss fight where you're about to fight the orc boss and all of a sudden the entire room turns green and then fades to black and then goes brighter green as I start having the orc cast a spell. Or the party suddenly dives underwater and you change the room to shifting blues and green lights. Like There's just something about that you can't convey just with words or sounds, right? Like the, having the light shift is awesome. Now, I don't just use them for RPGs, though. I use them for board gaming, probably not as often as I should. It depends. It's, I tend to forget I can do it. But there are two settings specifically on the Philips Hues 
called Bright and Concentrate that I find really good to make the light closer to actual white, which is good when you're playing games where you have um, cubes or meeples of similar colors or playing pieces or boards where it's hard to tell the colors on the boards. So I find that really useful for kicking it up the um, contrast in the room. So it's easier to tell colors and cubes and things apart. Uh, so two things here. Actual white is not a real thing. Uh, humans are awesome creatures when it comes to adaptability. So unless you're actually planning on using cameras, uh, white can be just about anything. Um, and your eyes will adjust again. The, the entirety of the room makes a huge difference. So when you, if you've got a dark room, that's going to affect what you find white is. Uh, and two, as Mo said, uh, there are a lot of solutions available. Don't rush into this too quickly. Uh, there are a lot of solutions at a lot of different prices. And they are almost all, sadly, incompatible with yeah. each other. So when you make that choice and start spending a little bit of money, you're going to be locked in because, oh, I've already spent $250 on Hue lights. I And these other lights I now want aren't compatible at all. And I don't want to have to use two different apps to run my things. Mm -hmm. So uh, do be cautious. Um, in some ways, you're actually better going super cheap. Because a lot of the super cheap options that don't have fancy apps like you and such are actually more likely to be able to be made compatible with you. Right. Um, like I've got literally uh, 30 or 40 feet of this cheap Chinese uh, light in a strip lighting. Uh, and for 40 bucks, I have now picked up an adapter which will allow me to go into Hue with all of my mm -hmm. cheap Chinese lighting. Um, whereas if I'd spend it on a different, you know, name brand, I wouldn't have that option. Uh, so do think about real carefully when you're, before you start uh, investing in a setup, because you're going to be stuck with it for a while. Yeah. I've noticed with uh, the Android apps, Q and L I F X or Lifix or something like that. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Those two yeah. are compatible, but right. other than that, all the apps I have, those are the only two they'll control. Yep. without some form of adapter or something like that. I said, I went Hue long ago when it was still new technology and I paid way more than they cost now, which is kind of cool. But I had Amazon credit at the time and kind of went nuts. because I'm like, I heard about doing this role-playing thing and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Another one for our might, mu not must-haves, Want to have stuff that, that you've got your table, you got your room, you got your chairs. What else can we have? And that's access to drinks. Now, when I first noted this, I had food and drinks, but really, I don't think I've been to many game rooms except at a local game store where there's food. But man, I want my coffee. We have a Tassable coffee maker in our game room. And I kind of think that a game room's not complete without a Tassimo or a Keurig or some form of coffee maker. But I like coffee. My wife likes coffee. Most of the people I game with like coffee. A bar fridge would be cool. Uh, I personally have a fridge down in the basement, so it's not far away, but it'd be kind of neat to have a bar fridge. Now, I do have a friend, Max, that actually has a custom-designed beer fridge in his game room that has two taps, and he has different cooling zones for different styles of beers. So it's warmer at the top and kind of middle in the bottom. I, I guess that's kind of cool. It's, it's nice, so you don't have to leave the room and stop the game in order to get refreshments. Coffee more coffee that is all <laughs> but next up we have some suggestions on how to bring your game room up to that next level yeah okay this is this is the the, the somewhat crazy stuff right like some people probably have some of this stuff nowadays uh with modern houses are more common one of the things i personally would love to have is wired internet in my basement because tech at the table is becoming more and more common and most of that tech works best or needs to be online to use it like, can you imagine having a spot for every player to jack in their laptop, removing the strain and limitations of Wi-Fi? So for the most part, I would say this is actually a bit of an older need that isn't as practical anymore. Now, if you dropped a wireless access point into your gaming room so you can get a solid five gigahertz signal to everyone, that could be great. But only if you've got enough bandwidth for everyone. Uh, if your network slows to a crawl once two people are hitting Board Game Geek, then there's less point in giving everyone access to your network. I don't know. Maybe a repeater would help, but my Wi-Fi, for some reason, the basement just is not good. I've been running to run a cable down there for a while. Yeah, Plus, my video game consoles are down there, and it'd be really nice to have those wired instead of wireless. Yep. 
Now, this one, similar to the last one, is power. Even if your group is not using laptops, almost everyone's got a cell phone. Plus, there's tablets, e-readers, iPods, iPod touches, iPads, whatever. Lots of tech. The problem with all these mobile devices is they never seem to be able to hold a charge long enough. Going back to we played, tried to play World of Yoho, and we had to put the Kraken in the middle of the board, which was the charging device everyone was plugging into, so our phones didn't die while plugging. What I would love to see is a custom game table with USB charging ports at every player spot, or maybe in the legs. And heck, combine it with the last two and have an Ethernet port there right on the table. And well, yeah, you better put a standard plug too so the laptop doesn't die. Now, most boardrooms solve this by mounting power bars either in the center or underneath mm -hmm. the table. Uh, just make sure you're thinking about where people's legs are going to be. Uh, and the big problem you run into is how to get the power to the table from the wall, but we'll get more on that later. One thing I'll note is there are a whole lot of options now where you can get power bars that have USB plugs built in yeah. all in one. So think about it. I mean, for, you know, nothing, for less than 20 bucks, you can get power bars with USB ports, mount the, and they're all mountable. They all have screw uh, holes on the back. You mount those right under the table and there's that solves half your problem right there. Now, this one, next one is specifically because we're now trying to stream games. Friday nights, 8.30 p.m. Eastern, right here on Twitch. Uh, streaming is the new hotness. Lots of people are doing it. I'm doing it. But I'm doing it with a tripod sitting on my game table, kind of up as high as it'll possibly go with my low ceiling, angled down a bit so we can try to fit the whole group in and the table. And all I'm using is a Logitech web camera. It would be so much better if I could have a wired room like a room with a mic for every player and multiple cameras that are actually like away from the table, not only capturing the game, but the people across, right? Like a camera behind everyone's head, catching the people across with them. I'm sure you've seen streamers out there that have these amazing setups. I know I have, and I get very jealous when watching those streams. Now, one thing I'll say when it comes to camera is we're back at lighting. The best camera in the world will be brought to its knees by bad lighting, and the worst cameras can do remarkable things with <laughs> good lighting. Uh, if we were properly able to light the Bellhop's tabletop, that uh, Linksys uh, Logitech camera would actually do a really nice job for the wide shot. Uh, yeah. But it needs enough light, and as we've said, we've had problems there. Yeah, we done. We we made it brighter. What I got to remember is I, again with the hue. I got to remember to put it on that brightest setting. That does make a difference, and I tend to forget that that's an option. Now. We talked about this just a little bit because now you've got all this stuff hooked up in your room. Again, I'm thinking mainly for streaming. You got people with laptops, you've got power bars, people want to plug in their their phones, and you got mics and things. It's cables. I I personally have this dream image. See, going back to the boardroom table, the last place I worked, there was this panel in the floor. And you popped open the panel and there were six different types of cables there. And I don't know how they were hooked up, but they retracted and you just pulled them out and plugged in whatever the heck you needed. And one was the HDMI for the TV. And another one was an optical for the surround sound for the room. It was, it was like a boardroom made by people who wanted to watch sports, which I think was kind of the plan when they made that boardroom. I don't work there anymore, though. So that was a thing. But I have this dream of seeing that from my ceiling, right in the middle of the game table, where they can come down over the middle of the table and don't get in the way and can't be tripped over by anyone going to the bathroom. Because I don't know how many times people have moved the mic, tripped over the Hue Bloom cord, or unplugged the laptop while we were trying to play a game. Uh, that's another reason not to game in basements. Yeah. Uh, if you're gaming on other floors of a home, you may well have options where you can run those cables up from the floor under the table without crossing over the floor. Uh, why? Because dropping cables down in the middle can sometimes impede things visually or get in the way of, of you know, maps and things on the uh, board, which could be a pain. True enough. Yeah, it may offset a bit. <laughs> Another one that'd be really cool to have, because I've seen lots of people do this, is a digital screen. Like, I personally want one of these for D&D, because D&D is the one game I like to play with maps and minis. I like to use my dungeon tiles. But dungeon tiles are a real pain in the butt to set up, and i got to get them set up before the players come off. And then there's a whole fog of war and having to pause the combat to set them up. And what I would much rather do is have a screen that I can just project the map on or plug my laptop into and the players can place their miniatures right onto that screen. Now there's lots of different ways to do this. This is getting more and more popular as time goes on. I think it was the first 10 years ago I first saw this using old flat screen TVs just basically sat on their 
table and people putting minis on top of them. I've seen other people do it with projectors in the ceiling. What I personally want, though, is one of those like high-end gaming tables where the inset board with a neoprene mat, but you take that neoprene mat on and there's a screen underneath. So I can play board games one night, remove the mat, and play an RPG on the screen the next night. Now, again, if you've got the height, a ceiling-mounted digital projector from Staples will get the job done fantastically and be pretty cheap, but yeah. you do need the height. But if you really want the toys, mm -hmm. the Microsoft Surface Studio would be a killer toy for GMs yeah. or game players, but they are generally stupidly overpriced. Yeah, very true. I've, I've looked at those. There, there is a D&D &D demo out there. If, if you, I think if you Google it, if you Google Microsoft Surface D&D, &D, you'll find it where like it's recognizing the player's miniatures and it's doing spell yeah. effects and oh, it's oh. awesome. Yeah. Like I have local friends who have done the take the TV and convert it and put it down on the table, but it's a TV sitting on your table, right? Like I, I want the next level. So that's it. That's, that's all I've got. Um, these are some of the things I would do to make my green room a bit better, along with some thoughts on what I think makes for a great game room. Now, what feature does your perfect game room have? I want to know in the comments below. That's on YouTube, obviously. Uh, for those of you listening on the podcast, hit me up on Twitter. Hit me up on Facebook. I want to know what, what features does your perfect game room have? Now, Angie Games did accuse me of having a bias towards streaming in this, but I couldn't think of much I would change that isn't just for streaming. Like, just one of the things I know Sean hates about my game room is the location of the garbage bin. So, yes, having garbage available would be nice. And, yeah, getting around my table, my tables, my table to the bookshelves, there's not a lot of room around the outside of it, especially for adult large gamers, which thankfully most of us are starting to become smaller adult gamers so it's a little better than it used to be but we do it, have a, a bit of a space it's, it's still a very big table for the room for the space yeah yeah see back in the day when i bought the house i was big into warhammer fantasy battle and warhammer fantasy battle required an eight by four table at that time to play so my dream table was always an eight by four table so i was actually something else something i would love that we don't have the room is I would love two four by four tables that you can literally split and do the two group thing. We do the two group thing at my table, but you can't get that person on the end, right? You can't get the four people around. The problem is in my basement, I split them and then what? Like there <laughs> wouldn't be that room in the middle. I'd have to get rid of the bookshelves on the two edges or even like two, what would you need? Three by four? Yeah. So if you had a three by four and a three by four, and then you can make a six by four. That would probably work in my game room. But I'm not really, I, my game table's fine. There's nothing <laughs> physically wrong with it. And it no, wasn't no. cheap. Despite the fact that it was cheaper than going to Tepperman's and buying a dining room table, it still wasn't cheap. Yep. So that's Do so you have anything, this, yep, uh, yep. like you commented on mine. Is there anything you would love to see in a game room, Sean? Um, I Really, it's it's all about sort of the comfort level and, and making sure that like, comfort both in sitting at the table, but also moving around the table is, is really the key for me. Uh, you know, you want those great chairs and uh, what you're going to be playing on uh, so depends on what you prefer to play. Like, I, you know, you, you said it really when it comes to like the RPG versus board games. Uh, I dream of RPGs uh, in a couch setting, you know, as yeah. you've got couches and uh, some nice looking uh, coffee or not coffee tables, but uh, uh, TV trays, like TV dinner mm -hmm. table sort of things. Uh, you know, put some dice towers on those so you don't go have to go skittering off after your dice. Uh, and that's that's it, right? You want to be super comfortable. Um, yes, if you're getting into the the, the more miniature based RPGs, you've got to think about that as well. But uh, well, that's when you bring in the projectors or your or digital <laughs> options and. Uh, you know, there's there's a whole lot now of uh, the options where you can do sort of digital role playing alongside, so everyone can be in the mm -hmm. room. But if everyone's got a tablet, they could be signed into digital options that allow you know a lot of that miniature stuff to not necessarily even need to be on a table. Um, yes. Even if you want to do miniature play, there's, there's because of uh, some of these technological options, uh, there's just so much there now. Uh, yeah, and, roll, roll twenty, I think, is the big one. Roll, roll twenty. Yeah, is roll the, twenty is roll twenty is the, huge. Is, is the big one now? Yeah, yeah. If everyone had a copy of roll twenty on their tablet, you'd be able to or laptop, then you could still be sitting in chairs, but still using your maps and minis. Yeah, and I mean, roll twenty even does like we again. We we uh, I, I was I sat through one of their uh, a discussion from one of their people at uh, the con last at breakout, um, 
and they do great stuff like fog of war and and all sorts of fantastic features that mm -hmm. are, are really hard to do so in, so in several ways they're better than having yes. that map out in front of you well that's um, it right like yeah. having to having to hold on everyone roll initiative okay i gotta go get my dungeon tiles and when i used yeah. to do dungeon tiles i make some pretty elaborate maps i'd take pictures on my phone so i'd have to get my phone and figure out what tile went where like I, I had some ways to cheat. Like I had each encounter in a Ziploc bag and stuff like that. But yeah, there were definitely problems with that. Yeah, uh, yeah. NG Games brings up a good one. Side tables. Uh, we talked about that with the food at the table episode. No drink should ever be on the actual game table. It should be on a side table. I know we're terrible. You can call us on it every <laughs> game, game, game. But yes, when I, I always think of it on New Year's. Like once the alcohol comes out, then I'm like, no, no, off yep. the table. When everyone's yep. just got Timmy's, I never think of it. Everyone's got their. But side tables for your drinks. Uh, if you're playing RPGs, I personally think side tables for your character sheets and stuff too. Off to the side, and then you can have it on the other. Yep. Uh, drop down whiteboard. I had forgotten about that. And she yeah. games and I had talked about doing that over the one window where we could just like pull it down and retract it. We do have a whiteboard, a whiteboard, especially if you run RPGs is fantastic. Uh, board games, not so much. I can't think of many things in board games. You want a whiteboard, but whiteboard, even just for like writing down initiative for doing plot maps, everything. Whiteboards are fantastic. If you've got an RPG now, I have one, but it's not mounted because every square inch of my walls is taken up by shelves to hold more games because I have a lot of games. Now, Shadzar has pointed out that if you just get a, a grand enough table, you get drawers that pull out built yes. into the table that have that you can use for snack trays with built-in mm -hmm. cup holders. And so, you know, the game's on the table and you can pull out your own little personal uh, side table slash uh, snack table right there. Oh, yeah, so. I've seen them. Uh, I mentioned it up in the tables. I forget the name. I think it's GameTables.com. I'm looking for it. Yeah, BoardGameTables.com. Has these amazing like cup holders, uh, heated armrests, almost like DM section where you pull it out and it's got a spot for your DM screen. Like they're, they're crazy, they're awesome, yeah. they're extremely impressive. That's a, probably the only way I would consider replacing my table. Is I don't know, I won a lottery <laughs> and I was able to get one of these high end gaming tables because well, some of the ones I really like are the fact that they can still be used as a table where you can cover up all the gaming stuff and yeah. put the wood over top and still have, to have people sit down for dinner. So, uh, Ursus Minor earlier said, some games work best at a skinny table, some work best at a large round table, and so on and so forth. So, their yeah. ideal game room would have a magic table that would change size and <laughs> shape to fit the needs of whatever game they're playing. Uh, now, to be honest, I actually think this is more realistic than they, I mean, they were making a joke, yeah. but if you get um, a selection of Costco folding tables, um, usually if you go for like the 3 by 2 or the 4 by 2 size, now, the awesome thing about the 4x2 tables is not only do they fold down pretty small uh, and flat, but you can also adjust the height of the table really huh. easily. And whereas the 6-foot tables don't usually enjoy do height. So if you've got a bunch of 4x2 tables, and then you go with table toppers of some sort. They don't yeah. necessarily be the super expensive ones. But some 4x2 tables and table toppers really allow you a lot of flexibility. And you can DIY your own table toppers uh, pretty, uh, pretty reasonably priced. Uh, and so now, that I don't would know. be my selection. Um, there is, I, I can't find it off the top of my head, and I'm not going to keep sitting here Googling. <laughs> uh, I looked the quick and didn't find it, but there is a shrinking table. It was a table on a yacht that starts off at like a four foot round table and you spun it and the thing tripled in size. Yes. So there are some magic tables out there. Like I've seen that one over the years shared by a bunch of different people. Yeah, there's a few. If you go on YouTube and, and search for uh, transforming furniture, yeah. There's, there's a few there YouTube videos that have a whole bunch of different doors and tables that uh, that do things. So I don't know. That, I, I don't think I've seen any. They're long, skinny to wide. I've seen skinny to wide. Yeah. Of course, there's the old 70s, the, the insert you put in the yep. middle, which I, I don't think you don't tend to see as often anymore nowadays. No, no. But yeah, there's definitely some high-end tables up there. So were there anything else in the chat about um, suggestions? I ended up closing it while I was looking for my <laughs> other thing. Uh, let's see. What else have we got here? Uh, you know, you can do, uh, <laughs> teller lamps for each player. If you're too dim, if you're, if you're too dim, you get table, uh, you get a little, little, uh, little, little, uh, reading lamps, lamps for each, each player. player. There you go. Uh, um, actually, Chad's are mentioned under the table projector. That's an interesting idea. I, I hadn't thought of that, but the only problem, wouldn't it have to be a very thin surface? Like, is that going to well, be able to hold up to miniatures and everything? I mean, you can get an RP, uh, a rear projection screen. The problem with rear projection screens is they scuff, they tend to scuff and, and uh, mess up easily. And you also just have to stretch them tight enough 
uh, and finding a way to stretch them tight enough and put things like on be top in of them. A, yeah, and you're like you're gonna be yeah. putting miniatures on top. Yeah, of them, so right? it, it'll like, be it'll be iffy. I would rather project over top and just try not to use you know giant dragons or or figure out what's yeah underneath. The, the over top works pretty good. I, I again I've seen people do that. You do get some shadows. Uh, the other problem that uh, over top projector hurts for is the lighting in your room. You often need to dim it so much to be able to see the projection that you can no longer see your character sheets or you're straining your eyes to see your character sheet. So it depends yeah. how much you need to actually reference stuff. So like if you're playing a 4E D&D and you've got all your action cards and there's a lot of choosing things off sheets, you probably don't want the projector. Whereas if you're running more of a theater of the mind BX style D&D where it's all just D20s and D6 rolls and everything's more wishy-washy and you don't have to look up little numbers and bonuses all the time it probably worked a little better uh and chad is mentioning uh game rooms can get hot too make sure you've got uh you know enough air circulation for the number of people you plan on having uh, i saw that... a similar comment on twitter was make sure you have heated floorboards or socks or blankets for people's feet which is something we have in our game room i tend to tell people who come to my house feel free to leave your shoes on because it's tiled floor. I can clean it easily enough. And it does. It gets cold. Yep. Uh, although you do have to watch out uh, if you are using heating or cooling solutions, make sure you, if, uh, for board gamers, make sure you are keeping an eye on your humidity. Yes. Humidity uh, is big. Yeah. Cardboard boxes and humidity, not friendly. Says the guy who has a humidifier in a box that's been called out on our stream twice because we haven't taken the time to actually set it up. That's true. <laughs> All right. Uh, and Shadzar mentions plexiglass cover for the uh, the RP screen. See, the problem, once you do that, then the miniatures look like they're floating over the map, which yeah. doesn't sound like a big thing, but man, it's it's annoying. Because yeah, you that's... can't always you can't always tell which square you're yeah. on, depending on, on sizes of things. Yeah, That's the disadvantage we found with the put your TV flat and just play on it. You have to remove that glass or yeah. else it just... It like it really can be bad. It depends yeah. how thick it is. Yeah, you, you get really thin enough to get the glass, maybe, but yeah, you need to get up over top of it to to sort of see. It, it's one of those things you wouldn't expect, but yeah. knowing two friends who've done it, it it looked bad. Like the minis floating there were worse, and they switched back to actually using a paper map for a while, and then they managed to get a different type of flat screen where they were able to remove the glass, and then yeah. I don't know what they did to protect the screen so you weren't scratching it, but they did something. You know, you're you're the same. Basically, you could use the same sort of idea as you got on a cell phone, right? Your cell phone screen protector, yeah. the little stick on bit. Yeah, they did something like that, like a thin protector as opposed yeah. to the glass. But they said the glass, like it was bad. It was it was distracting. Well, I think that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read more about gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see plenty of topics answered in blog form. And remember, if you've got a question for us, head over to the website, pound that, ask the bellhop words at the top, click on that, tap on that, whatever you're using, or just email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. All right. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share to your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Getting there slowly. The word's getting out. Would love to see more people listening, interacting, commenting. And really, especially if you if you enjoy our show, hit that subscribe on your podcatcher. And uh, those numbers really do help us. So even if you actually are listening to us on YouTube, it would help us if you uh, subscribed on a podcatcher. Even if you deleted them after they downloaded every week, those numbers do count for something. And remember, if you're here on Twitch, hit that follow button to get notified when we go live. We do do two scheduled shows a week, but every now and then we'll jump on for something special like an unboxing. Yep. Also, to keep track of what we put out there, what content we've got, you can sign up to receive the Tabletop Bellhop Weekly Newsletter. Once a week, I send out an email. It recaps all the content we've released in the week previous. Uh, you're going to find out about our blog posts, our new podcast episodes, reviews, or anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Now, we haven't said it in a while, so I'm going to say it again. Uh, Deanna just pointed this out. If you get a chance, we would love a review on iTunes. We used to call this out every episode, and I got sick of saying it every week. But 
iTunes reviews mean a lot more than people think. Uh, even if they're one-star reviews, five stars would be way better. I'd much appreciate those. Before you leave a one-star, I'd love to hear why you're leaving a one-star, but fair enough. Uh, but getting reviewed there actually has us show up higher in search, because unfortunately the word tabletop is rather popular. Uh, bellhop, there are oddly bellhop podcasts about being a bellhop and the weird things people bellhops hear and see. So... Those come up before we do sometimes on searches. So getting those reviews on re on iTunes are actually really big for us. Uh, everywhere else too, Spotify, all those reviews also count. But everyone uses the iTunes numbers, right? Apple ruins the universe or whatever. They're the Illuminati. Everyone listens to their algorithm. So a review on iTunes would be awesome. And for those of you on YouTube, hitting that subscribe button is similar. We disappear under the radar we're not even noticed by the algorithm unless we hit a certain number of subscribers plus it's a great way for you to keep track on if we put out anything new yeah i'm thinking we're, we're gonna have to bulk up the announcements again just to mention those things rapid fire not in as much detail as this but just to remind people yep. itunes is big it's not like i'm an apple fan or anything i was for a little while moved away from that all right, now would be time for our weekly Gloomhaven update. But as we announced last week, we didn't play Gloomhaven Friday. Instead, I taught Sean, Tori, and Kat one of my favorite games, Shogun. We're going to let that game and other games we played this past weekend in our usual tabletop gaming weekly segment coming up next. Now, what I did want to let people know here and why I kept the segment in the show, at least for those of you watching live, is that we are going back to Gloomhaven this Friday. Now, the plan right now, as long as nothing horrendous happens, is Tori Cat are going to run through a two-player random dungeon while I basically play GM, and I'm going to moderate the game. I'm going to run the bad guys, and I'll probably actually do more of the interacting with the chat. So if you can join us live, that'll be a good chance uh, to actually get some interaction going. This will give us a chance for both of our orchids to get some much-needed XP. Yeah, and give Tori a chance to get used to his new character because he just unlocked the Doom Seeker, and the first outing was slightly shameful, not just on his part, but the whole group. So having him know his character and us seeing more of it, I think, is going to really help. All right, so join us Friday at 8.30 p.m. at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop and see how Kator do on their own. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tabletops? Now, every week, we like to do one of these. We take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. This weekend, both Sean and I got in five games together. While I was mainly down in Windsor to visit some family and get in some great food, we didn't miss the opportunity to get in some gaming, too. Now, speaking of food, I got to ask, what do you think of the Giro pizza from Roma's in LaSalle? Well, I think it was you that mentioned it while we were there. But while it was great, I can't imagine having it too often. Yeah. I'd definitely love to hit that place up now and then for some. But uh, as a you know a weekly trip or something, I don't think I'd be thrilled with it as often. Yeah, it's a, it's a unique, uh, fairly strong taste. I, rich, I guess, is, is one way to look at it, especially for a pizza. So, yeah, it's definitely something, like, I crave it. Like, a month will go by, and I'm like, oh, I need gyro pizza. And then I have gyro pizza, and I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good yep. for a while. Yep, no, absolutely. And, well, one more food item before we get into a game, because uh, th th this shout-out is well-deserved. This is a shout-out to Kigeru Ramen House. Uh, it's a pop-up ramen shop that shows up at Eros Asian Eatery, Saturdays, noon till 3, head chef Solon Wong for his latest creation, the tomato chicken ramen. Yeah, I've been championing, the, championing in this on my feeds ever since I tried it. <laughs> I was tempted not to order it based on the name. Uh, it sounded a lot like I'd be eating something tomato soupy, yeah. and that's not for me. I didn't grow up with grilled cheese and tomato soup, uh, <laughs> and so that's not a comfort food for me. But I trust Solon, so I ordered it, and I was blown away. Incredible flavors, rich taste, and I won't go on for too long because it's not gaming, but if you do get the chance to big thumbs up thank yeah. you solon for such a uh, wonderful new item on the menu yeah i know we're supposed to be a gaming podcast but i'm also the big dude who likes food so got to get the food in there and just explain why sean felt the need to stop into windsor even though he was just stopping to see family just to get some food <laughs> so on to the games list. so up first is shogun which is not the old 
card game from the 80s or the remake of Samurai Swords or the Avalon Hill game Shogun. This is the retheme of Wallenstein. Now, just a little tiny bit of history to why this was a big deal for me. So a few weeks back, I got to try Immortals. This is the latest cube game. I love cube tower games. Dirk Hen is the master of the cube tower. And Immortals was, I don't know, I had mixed thoughts. And I, you can listen to our previous episodes if you've been following along, you've heard them. The thing that's important to note here, though, is that while we were playing Immortals, I couldn't help but compare it to the, the earlier games, Wallenstein Shogun, that Immortals is obviously based on. And every time I played it, which was only two times, but I just kept saying to the other players, I'm like, oh, man, you guys have got to play Shogun or you guys have got to play Wallenstein. Like, if you like this at all, and then people would complain about something in Immortals. And I'm like, yeah, it's so much better in Shogun. Well, with Deanna recovering for surgery and no Gloomhaven campaign being played, I took last Friday as a chance to act on that desire to actually share my love of the original Cube Tower games. Plus, there was the bonus that Sean was going to be down and he played Immortals with us. And actually, out of the four of us who played the first time, I think had the worst experience of the game. And I really wanted to show this off. So I let the group pick. I said, I don't, I don't care. Wallenstein or Shogun, they're literally the same game. Uh, different themes, different maps, but the mechanics are identical, literally identical. They're the same game. Uh, overall, the group decided the Samurai theme seemed cooler, so I was cool with that. I set up the game before everyone showed up. Uh, for those that know the game, we use the Sun side of the board, which is a little more friendly to new players, and we use the default army setup, which makes sure that everyone has a balanced start set of starting provinces and armies. So it was kind of nice to sit down and have a game <laughs> all set and ready to go like this. It's not too often that I get that experience in real life. Uh, and it's nice if you have the opportunity to give that to a group every once in a while. I mean, it's it's also good to have, make sure your your game your game group helps setting up and taking down games. Yeah. But every once in a while, if it's convenient and, and it works, uh, it's nice to be able to sit just sit down and start playing a game every once in a while. Yeah, if you are the host and you know what game you're going to play first, do this, right? Take the time if you can. I, I managed to pull this off. The main thing is you have no idea how frustrating it is to set up Shogun with other people and going, okay, you have five armies at Iku. Do you see Iku? It's just one of those. It works way better if it's set up at that time, but I'm glad you appreciated it. Now, teaching the game went pretty quickly. I could have been a longer teach. We did record it. You can actually learn to play Shogun by watching that video, I think. I actually rewatched myself teaching it, and I was... I was happy with myself. I, it was a proud moment. I'm like, it went pretty good. Uh, it did help that all three of the other players had played Immortals. And some of the core mechanics, like the main one of programming actions each turn using province cards, is the same in Immortals. And that's a big part of Shogun. So having had it, the, the group already knew that aspect of the game really helped. Uh, most of the teaching did involve me basically going, this is how this is different than Immortals. And remember how in Immortals this, in Shogun it's this. One of the things, though, that I noticed while teaching it, which is something I kind of knew in the back of my head, but it didn't really come out until I was literally in the middle of teaching it, is that Shogun is so much better tied to the mechanics. The theme and mechanics are integrated so much better. Like as an example of this, in Shogun, one of the actions you can do is confiscate rice from your, from your people. Well, if you do that, it pisses off the people and they can revolt. Well, the fact that they're getting pissed off is represented by a token. Revolt tokens also matter when there's a battle. So the farmers are already upset, as shown by a revolt token. They fight for the attacker. But if they're happy, there's no revolt token there. They fight for the defender because they're happy. No one's done anything to piss them off. Now, that is so much more thematic and intuitive than the way the inhabitants in Immortals work. Even by the second game of Immortals, we were having difficulty trying to explain how fights work and who the green cubes fought for. Yep. Uh, so I felt pretty good while you were teaching, uh, perhaps even overconfident <laughs> as I laid out my plan, even while you were teaching some detail, which may not have been the smartest move, but I, I don't actually feel that that was what let me down later. Uh, the programming portion of it just came pretty naturally after playing Immortals. Now, I am not going to tell you how to play Shogun. Uh, the best way you can learn that is literally watch the video. That'll be going live. I don't know, Sean, when we put that out up Saturday, yeah, maybe. It may go up Saturday, I'm hoping. But anyway, the, the next couple of weeks, if you're listening to this on the podcast, it's probably already live. 
Uh, it'll be all over social media when I do share it. I'll be putting links up to the Shogun video. Uh, so I'm not going to describe the full game. But I will say that this game is not only easier to teach than Immortals. I, I would say it's probably easier to learn. Uh, basically, what I think is, um, I've talked about it a lot. Everyone already knows I like it. So what do you think of one of my favorite games? Well, to start, I enjoyed it vastly more than Immortals. Uh, no comparison in time, really. Uh, Immortals didn't do it for me. While this, I'm happy to sit down at again. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say in BGG scale, it's at least at seven. Um, so I'm very happy to sit down at it again. Uh, more than anything, I'd like to <laughs> refine my horrible strategy uh, and make some moves a little bit more suited to that game. Because I, I, I in hindsight, I think there was definitely some um, uh, Immortals left over in me. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about a more aggressive game uh, and sort of, Programming something for more aggressive when realistically, because you can only make a couple of attacks and, and the randomness of, of turn yeah. order and things, I was getting bit in the rear and couldn't do anything once I'd lost. Yeah, I, I tried to stress it when teaching that game yep. that you only ever get 12 attacks the entire game. Yep. So make sure you save them up for the right things. And I try to stress to watch what provinces you're taxing from and which ones you're getting food from because there's only 12 attacks in the game and people are going to go after them. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I try to get as much of that across, but it, it is a game that definitely playing it the second time is going to help. Yeah. Now, I think I've got it rated a 9. So I, it is one of my top games. I really do dig it. Actually, I think I have Shogun rated an 8 and Wallenstein a 9. Because actually, out of the two, I prefer Wallenstein. I like the map better. It's a little more aggressive. You can't turtle. You can't just sit back and do nothing. Which you can kind of do in Shogun. If you've got a couple of good provinces, you can just build up armies on your outside. And go, I built lots of buildings, and you can't come take them. Right. Now, there are counters to that. But I'm I, glad I, to hear you like that. Uh, Tori and Kat were discussing buying it, so I think right there is probably the the biggest. Yeah, they must have liked it. Uh, there was no, we're going to teach mom. That's that's the the surefire for Tori and Kat. If they they mentioned they're going to teach mom, then I'm like, oh, they like this one. Yeah. But it wasn't a mom style game. I think the main reason I I'm not rating it higher uh, is it's not necessarily the type of game I well yeah I drift to first. Um, uh, I think it's, you know, again, it's one of those enjoyable games and, and it's fun to play down there, but it's not something I would ever buy because that's just not my go to kind of game. Yeah, you're not really a folks on a map area control no. gamer at this point. No, it's an enjoy. It's an enjoyable thing. But again, it's, yeah, it's just not my collection. Yeah, for that for that style of game, that's my favorite. There are others I like. Up next, we're going to get into a style that is more to Sean's liking, and that is Valeria Card Kingdoms. Now, when I first got a hold of Tori and Kat and said, hey, we're probably not going to play Gloomhaven this week, just stuff's going on, and I, Sean may be coming into town, we're probably going to skip it. The first thing I got in text message on Facebook from Tori is Valeria, because he really wanted to play Valeria Card Kingdoms. He first tried this back at my birthday bash back in January and has been itching to play since. Now, I explained that I really wanted to show off Shogun or Wallenstein, and he's like, all right, cool, but on one condition, if we finish early enough, we play Valeria. And I'm like, eh, why not? But I added my own stipulation, and that was that we use the Shadow Veil expansion, which is going to be coming off the pile of shame. It's something I just got kickstarted, just released in 2019. Now, sure enough, Shogun did end early enough, and we did get to play Valeria. Yeah. Now, I had also played this with Tori, uh, and while there was some mild extreme play that first time, it was a solid and enjoyable game, but I was more than happy to sit down uh, to again. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Valeria Card Kingdoms overall. Uh, the year it came out, I can't remember, it was 2015, 2014. We were at Origins, Deanna and I, we went to the Daily Magic booth. They gave us purple nerds. We sat down, did on a demo, found out halfway through the person giving it the demo was the designer of the game. After that demo, they're like, hey, you guys seem to really like this. I'll tell you what, you buy it right now, we'll throw in the first two expansion packs. Sold. Done. Paid full price. I don't pay full price for games often. <laughs> I did get two bonus expansion packs, so I guess I got a bit of a deal out of it. That was the first game I bought that convention. We only went home with about three games. That was the first one. And I think Deanna and I played 10 times or so before heading back to Windsor. Like, we're at the secret cabal, cabalist meetup with 500 gamers going nuts, drinking way too much beer, doing giveaways, sitting in a booth playing Valeria Card Kingdoms. And Lance, uh, Lance Mixter, the undead Viking, comes over and is like, how can you guys be playing a game in this chaos? I'm like, this game's good. <laughs> we were kind of hooked, so... I like Valeria. So enough about Valeria. What I want to talk about here, though, is the Shadow Veil expansion. 
this includes this is almost like a new core set and if i remember correctly from the kickstarter you could have bought it as a core box as in you didn't need to own valeria now i own valeria so i bought it as the expansion set it has a complete set of new citizens so all the citizens from the original replaced five completely new monster decks again completely replaces the ones from the original with five new decks a complete set of new domains new events which events were something that were released as an expansion but events that are new to this and five new dukes now because i backed the kickstarter i also got the relics expansion with my box i don't know if that's a kickstarter exclusive but it was because of the Kickstarter, it came with my set. I think everyone else can buy it separate, or it might have been Kickstarter exclusive. I'm not sure. But anyway, we had Relics. Now, there's enough stuff in here that you can basically replace everything in the base game with key cards from Shadow Veil vale and just use Shadow Veil, vale, and that's what we did. We played, we didn't touch anything from the original box set. We just played 100% Shadow Veil. Vale. What I thought was interesting about Shadow Veil vale is that I didn't really notice we were playing Shadow Veil. Vale. It just felt like we were playing Valeria. It, didn't really have a distinct feel that made it feel different. Now, I'm pretty sure some of the mechanics were new. Like, I don't remember removing cards from the game ever before. So I think that was a brand new mechanic. Uh, it did feel a little more cutthroat. There was more like one of the base citizens stole resources instead of generating them. So that, I guess, felt a little different. But overall, it just felt like we were playing Valeria. And I got to say, I like that in an expansion that I just felt like I was playing the game I liked. I wasn't a huge fan of, um, I said citizens, but I'm not sure that's the right word, but the, the role of, of, of actions on top of the monsters. Um, uh, agents. That was, agents, yes. I didn't bring up agents here because I, they didn't come in this. Right. Um, that so, was something we had grabbed from the box. Okay. So yeah, agents, I wasn't sure, but I, I wasn't sure if, if their newness was a problem or uh, if, if, they, if they actually were out of whack power wise. So that was a bit, uh, a bit strange. But uh, yeah, yeah, otherwise, I've, it felt like a game with just different cards than we used last time. It, yeah. yeah, the agents agents were not from this. Agents, I don't even know how we ended up with them out on the table. I think we just grabbed them out somewhere. They did not come in Shadow Veil. Vale. So I, I actually don't know where I got that expansion from. I'm sure it was something else I probably backed or bought on a discount. I wasn't going to talk about it here because I meant to go dig into it and figure out where I got those from, and right. then I never found the time. Now, there was something new on the table, and those were relics. So that was the one thing that was completely new to Shadow Veil. Um, this is a new deck of cards and a new mechanic that adds something to Valeria that wasn't there before, which again, didn't really feel like it changed the game much. But what it does is every player got two random cards and then each of the cards gives the players a unique ability. Uh, I had this treasure chest and I think it was just called the treasure chest that let me swap any three resources for any five resources, but it took one of my two actions. I remember Cat seemed to have an way more powerful item that was an axe that made fighting better that made the cost of defeating every monster cheaper i what did yours do so i had um i don't even remember what it was but it, it basically it was one uh one red gave me two blue uh and but it took an action so yeah. it was you know compared to having one less cost for defeating a monster it just didn't really compare to me and so i it did feel a little on the imbalanced side but again, we haven't really explored them all. Uh, you know, we had two. I sort of picked one randomly because I wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. um, it could have been that, you know, I just picked the wrong one out of the two we had. Uh... Yeah, that's possible. Like, I, I I like the fact they add an asymmetric element. We've talked about that before. I tend to really enjoy asymmetric elements. Having every player have something unique is cool. But I, I'm not sure if they were balanced or not. It didn't really feel like it in that one play. Yeah. Which... Balance is the thing that leads me to the one complaint I've been hearing about Valeria, often from Sean. And that is something that was most definitely not fixed with that expansion, and it's the Dukes. Um, basically, I'll let Sean rant about this one, because he has in the I, past. I do. I'm I always do. surprised by him going on about how much he loves the game when I hear it, this rant. It's funny, because the gameplay, as you're playing the game from start until you're about to count your victory points, I love this game. I really do. But the Dukes, which are the end game scoring method, ruined the game for me. Um, and the problem is grammar. Mm -hmm. They have used a specific way of, of writing in the actual end game scoring on each Duke. That is, if you read it, as far as I'm concerned, if you read it properly, as far as grammar rules, using the commas mm -hmm. and, and, and punctuation that they have included, says one thing. But the game says something else. And this this time you reminded us 
Mm -hmm. And I realized that I got it wrong last time, and I thought I was making the correction to the right way, but I was actually correcting it the wrong way. And I, I messed it up again. 100% on me. But that Well, no, because that the grammar is wrong. The grammar is wrong. The grammar is wrong. But again, I knew it was I knew it, there was something wrong and I corrected it the wrong way. I, uh, I I I made that mistake. But even aside from that, once I recounted my tokens. I still don't think it was possible to have beaten your Duke with my Duke. Um, and, and this is why I think that there really might be a problem with the agents and why they really might be imbalanced is because while I haven't taken all the Dukes and taken a really good look and said, and said, you know, oh no, this is, they are balanced if you, if you, if you play it right, um, I have a sneaky suspicion that they are actually unbalanced. I don't think a 1x Duke can beat a 2x Duke um, unless you're, I mean, maybe if you're really good at the game, you know, if you've got a whole lot of turns playing it, but even then it seems, it seems tough to, to you know, be able to get m more points than what you have with double of whatever it is you're going for. Now, I I fully admit the grammar thing is a problem. Totally, hundred percent. That it's something I I don't get how they just put out a new expansion and didn't fix it. Like there are so many threads on Board Game Geek where the designer gets involved and says, "No, no, it's supposed to be read like this." Then why not put it on the cards like that? Yeah. Like, are you trying to stick to some legacy look that were on your old cards? Like, I don't get it. Like that should have been. Fixed, I, I'm but. not a sleeve fan, but I honestly think the Dukes should probably be sleeved so that you can put a a more <laughs> correct Over top. Just there write it in so it actually makes sense and leave it at that. Yeah. Because again, I love the game, mm -hmm. except for the Dukes. Yeah. <laughs> well, like I said the grammar thing. I agree. On. I'm not sold on unbalanced Dukes though. Like I, I played this game a lot, like more than twenty times, and I've never seen a problem with it. I think the big thing is making sure people understand those bonus points they'll be getting for resources. Because the offset on the times one card versus the times two card is the reward for how many resources they get. And it's so they know what resources to collect. And actually to clarify that, which is the problem of the game, isn't which resource, it's just collect anything you can. Right. And if you have one of those dukes that's going to get points for resources, you really need to focus on your engine building and getting citizens that give you lots of resources, as opposed to, say, fighting monsters or collecting symbols. But like I said, I've not seen yeah. it. I'm not sold on the fact that dukes are broken, but Sean has seen it, but he's only played a couple times. I, other people out there seem to think, I don't know, it, it's up in the air. I personally haven't seen it. But the grammar I, I, thing. I had that. some daily I had magic. Some, come on. I had some really big piles of resources in front of me, which is what I needed. Yeah. Uh and it I mean I was still half of what you were scoring wise. So I don't know. You'd have, you'd have to pull the dukes and run the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> All right, up next. Sean loves Valeria, just not end game scoring. <laughs> Just quit the game. Just like, eh, we're just done. We we're killed good. all the monsters. Walk away. Hey. It'll be a good game. Everyone wins. Uh, up next, over bagels and coffee, I taught Sean War Chest. Uh, I was smart this time. We played the first game with just the recommended starting armies. The four on each side that recommended the book. And then we tried a game with the random, unit, uh, random units. I personally think both games went very well. Uh, our second game was particularly interesting and close and was also the longest game of War Chest I played to date. By the end of the game, we each had a handful of units at the end. I literally had two. So when I had to draw chips from the bag, I'm like, I can only draw two. Uh, it was a total war of attrition, which was interesting to see. Now, I've talked about War Chest here on the show multiple times, so I'm going to hand this one over to Sean and let him talk about it. Now... I had actually seen this before Mo even actually ever played it uh, with D. Uh, I'd seen this sitting on one of the piles and said, I want to play this. Um, just looking at the box and, and flipping the box over and, and reading it, I was interested. Now, going into it, I had some expectations that were slightly wrong. Uh, I was thinking of it uh, more like Duke or chess-like than it actually was. But that's not a negative. That was just me liking the Duke. And, uh, and it just took a little bit of thinking to adjust. Uh, the big difference I find that you have to sort of keep in your mind and what caught me out more than once in planning out moves is that you don't stomp on top of a a, um, a a token to kill it. So you're not looking to get on top of people when you're planning your moves and attacks. Uh, you need to get next to them for an attack unless you've got a range, uh, yeah. a range attacker. Um, and so thinking, uh, you know, you're, you're, thinking, you're not thinking about, you know, if that horse has to move forward, forward two and over one, it has to end up next to the player, not on top of them. And that, that, that caught me up a little bit. But once you uh, got those movement 
uh, thoughts correctly. Uh, no, it's a fantastic game, uh, and there it's a really interesting assortment of potential pieces. Uh, mm -hmm. So once you once you're a little more familiar and you do start playing the random uh, pulls, it's great. And the actual mechanics of how you're you're commanding pieces and things um, is really interesting and a, and a fresh change from the Duke, where you're that much more limited by what you can pull out of the bag versus just oh I've got all these pieces in front of me, which one do I want to move? Well, you can only move the ones you want. Uh, mm -hmm. And there were a few times that caught you up. Um, whereas you just, you know, it was one of those who pulled the right piece first. Yeah. What I like is it, it's open information and it's not all at once. So there is the bagged pull, but you can always look at how many chips everyone has and where they all are, right? And you only have the four units. As opposed to the Duke, far too often in the Duke club, while I love the Duke, someone gets that lucky draw. The, eh, I'll draw from the bag. Boom, I win the game. Yeah. That happens a little too often, or I'm about to win and the person happens to draw that one tile that stops me from winning. It goes both ways. You don't tend yep. to get that in War Chest. You always know the odds. Right. You can always, you could sit there and do the math, and with only four units each and a max of five chips each, the math's pretty simple. Like, that's a game I can card count, right? You're yep. not card counting, you're chip counting, but I can pretty easily tell, ooh, Sean has three of those in the bag. He's probably going to draw at least one, if not two, on his next turn, so I better steal initiative to kill his unit before he goes, and so on. Or, or equally, He's got one of those on the board, but I've already killed three of them. He yeah. can't move that he piece. He can't move. It's and realizing dead, that. It's a important. dead piece, and I don't need to pay any attention to it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that one's even more important, right? And that's that's a mistake I see a lot of first-time players make, is they'll bolster the first turn without realizing they only had chip, two chips in their bag. Yeah. And once you bolster, you're like, I'm not going to point it out, because I want you <laughs> to learn to play, but your unit's not moving until you draft a new one. Yeah. yeah. Overall, still really dig War Chest. Been impressed every game I played. Just as good four player as two, which is another thing I was surprised by. Not that we played four player on the weekend, but it is the weekend before. Mm -hmm. So the last game we played before heading out and having that amazing ramen we talked about was Eminent Domain. This is an older deck builder from Tasty Minstrel Games, and we all know Sean loves card games and in particular deck builders. So I've been doing what I can to introduce them to a wider exposure of different types of games that do something different with deck building. Like the last time we was down, I introduced them to Clank and Core Worlds. Well, this time it was Eminent Domain. Now I picked Eminent Domain because to me, it's one of the most unique deck builders that really does do something different with the cards than other games. Because it's really, the main mechanic is really role selection. And deck building is kind of a secondary part of that. It's more like a race for the galaxy where... You're going to pick uh, a role between survey, warfare, colonize, produce trade, and research. Note it even has produce and trade together. So, like, there's definitely some race for the galaxy here. Now, each turn, you're going to spend one of your cards in your hand to do an action. But then the rest of your cards are just there to bolster the role you pick. And now the role can be any of the rules in the game. You don't even have to have the card in your hand. So that's where it's very different from most deck builders. Now, when you choose that role, you're going to take a new copy of that card. And in the main game is just those cards. Like that's your deck are those cards. Now there are some technology cards you get from the research action, but those just kind of break the rules and they're more like special abilities. So really you're just building your deck out of action cards. It's, it's very different. What's neat is it represents your experience or your specialization. So the more you do an action, the more copies of that card you get and the better you get at it. And I dig that because it's unique. It is not like any other deck builder you I, I own. And as you know, I like unique games. With the game collection I own, games stick out if they do something different. Now, in this play, I vastly mistook the importance of burning cards. And it yeah. bit me. Uh, but it was still a fun game and surprisingly quick for how yeah. deep a game it is. Uh, I feel like it plays a little faster than uh, Race for the Galaxy. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um now, there are a couple of expansions out there that help apparently help balance some of the gameplay. We, mm -hmm. we both commented uh, that the, the warfare actions yes. are a little unbalanced. Uh, I, I leaned a little bit too much into that. Um, even though I didn't double down on it, I still mm -hmm. leaned a little bit too much into it while you cleared, cleared yourself out of that early. And, uh, yeah. and I think that was sort of the big, the big game changer. Um, now, we have learned since that BGA, Board Game Arena, has... I'm going to domain available, yep. uh, and I'll be interested to see if they have any of the expansions. I didn't actually take a look. 
Um, yeah, I haven't had the time to play on Board Game Arena yet. I haven't even tried Terraforming Mars on Steam yet. Actually, to be honest, I booted it up and went through the tutorial, so I got to see that, but I haven't actually go. played it yet. No, I'm going to neat because one of the things that the game does is if you specialize too much, it as Sean said, it bites you in the ass, right? Your deck gets filled. I got hit with survey cards because at the beginning I was trying to find planets and I realized it soon enough and I'm like, wow, I got to start using my research cards to get these out of my deck. But it's just, it's so different. Like you... You build your deck by the actions you take. It's not buying cards from a market like every other deck builder out there. Yep. The fact that you are not buying the cards, I think, is very neat. Yep. So that's it for our week in review. Um, as I mentioned, we were talking about Shadow Veil that came off the pile of shame. So that's one down. So that should be the pile of shame down. But wait, wait, what? what's that right there? Oh, oh no, is the pile of shame going up? Uh, happy anniversary to Deanna and I. It is our anniversary. My wonderful wife was nice enough to buy this for me and give this to me today. So we have the pile of shame shades the same, and we're going to have to get Terraforming Mars Colonies played soon enough. All right. I may skip the unboxing just so I can play it. So you may or may not get an unboxing video for this one. Oh, and there it goes on the floor. So now that we've talked about what we played since last episode, is there anything you're looking forward to next week? Um, I'm assuming you're not going to make it back down to Windsor again and we can't play another round of Shoguns. So. No, no, not making it down. Uh, I th It could possibly be the most gaming I do is watching you guys play Gloomhaven on Friday. Uh, uh, we'll have to see how it goes. I'm actually not sure what my weekend looks like, um, but maybe it'll be raining and uh, we'll get some uh, we'll get some DC in. Yeah, obviously I have Gloomhaven on Friday, though. I don't know if I should even log that as a play if I'm DMing Gloomhaven. I probably will. I think that'll count. Um, the other thing for me is uh, CG Rome is having their game night Saturday. Uh, assuming my mom's health is is it, it's been on the mend lately, so assuming she's feeling good enough to watch the kids, I'll probably hit up CG Rome. No clue what I'm going to bring though. I'm, I'm really learning towards um, Strasbourg again because I that that quick feld has gone over well, and I think the people I played with last time were looking forward to trying it a second time. I I might try to grab something off the pile of shame. Um, I might. Colonies, though I think Deanna will be disappointed if I play it without there her. Might be some anger, there might, hey, might be some anger. She played issues. Prelude without me the first time. That's true. At Extra Life. I, I That's figured true, I owed but her. I don't she played think, my copy of Prelude. But I don't think Prelude was an anniversary gift. So... That's true. <laughs> that is true. Hmm. We'll see. <laughs> now... A quick shout out and a thank you to some of our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Misdirected Mark. Join Phil, Chris, Bob, and Camden every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. Oh, I should have updated that. If you happen to join the Misdirected Mark live show last night, you we would have learned that Camden has actually stepped back from doing the show. Oh. So just Phil, Chris, and Bob right now. Camden's got a bit too much going on. He may return as a guest. Um, so I, yeah, we'll have to update that for next week. I oh. forgot about that, but it is still Tuesday nights, 8 PM Eastern. Brian Kurtz. Thanks, Brian. Um, speaking of the Mr. Active Mark chat, he was there last night. It was cool to see you there. Uh, Duran Burnett. Thank you. Joe Swick. Thank you. Jeff Seuss. Thank you. Now, one quick note on a change you probably just noticed. No, we didn't lose a bunch of patrons. Uh, the news is actually much better than that. Instead, we've gained a few more. Uh, due to the length of the list going forward, instead of going through the full Patreon list, we're just going to highlight a few each episode. Don't worry if your patron didn't hear your name this week, it should be coming up soon. Well, that was a double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.